Okay, so let's begin. Welcome everyone to the session. Um, delighted to be here to be co-hosting uh, the Parasol Foundation International LLM program. Uh, before we begin, I'll just quickly introduce the team to you. Um, I'm David, I'm from the Lowy International School, and I'm just going to, I'll begin by giving a very quick five or ten minute overview about Tel Aviv University, about the Lowy International School, student life, funding, etc. I'll then hand over to Professor Ronan Abraham, um, who is the head of the Parasol Foundation uh, International LLM programme, who will then present the programme, um, along with Renata as well. I think Renata is here somewhere. Hi, Renata. And Hi, then everyone. We... And then we have a unique lecture by Dr. Uri Hakoin, um, harnessing artificial intelligence to inform legal standards. Uh, Dr. Hakoin is here. I do see him um, there. Welcome to the session. Um, great to have you here. So we are recording the session, everyone, but just so we can send it out to everyone who um, wasn't able to make it today because the registration numbers was a bit higher than the number that's actually come. So let me begin by playing a very short video then, that I think just sums up the uh, learning experience here at Tel Aviv University that we call Taoism. Now, if you can't hear or see my screen, just shout or holler or let me know. Tel Aviv University International the only place in the world where you can study Taoism. What is Taoism? Well, it's a local philosophy that says the best way to study is through experience. Understand with your head, learn with your feet. The best way to study a multicultural society is to live in one. Be ready with your elevator pitch. You never know who you'll meet on campus. If you want to learn the best marketing strategies, just go to the local market. Reading about the startup nation? Write your own chapter. Study literature in the place that inspired the bestseller of all time. You can't resolve a conflict until you witness one. At TAU, there is always room for more questions and 400 labs to find the answers. Come experience the wisdom of Taoism at Tel Aviv University International, where first class education meets a second to none lifestyle. Again. First of all, I know it was a bit on the low side. Um, I got given a new work laptop and the sounds um, are not that great, unfortunately. So sorry about that. But I will send it out to everyone by email afterwards so you can watch it along with other cool videos. Um, so oops, let me begin. Okay, so welcome to the session. I think Taoism just sums up our philosophy that, you know, you study best through experience. So, you know, you learn with your head, you understand with your feet, and learning happens everywhere, and sometimes when you least expect it. So when you come to Tel Aviv University, you don't just learn in a classroom, you learn in a campus, in a city, in a country, all of these things will transform you. Um, and I know that in particular, your program, you also take students off on trips to, to Google, to law firms, the Supreme Court in Jerusalem, um, visits to, you know, overnight trips as well. I think Ron and Matt will go into more detail about that. Uh, that's the whole idea that Taoism, that we call Taoism, just the philosophy that you study best through experience. 
So listen, this gives a good snapshot of Tel Aviv University. First of all, we're Israel's largest and most comprehensive institution of higher education. We have 30,000 total students, 2,000 are international. We have nine faculties, um, 125 schools and departments, 400 labs, one campus, 220 acres just north of downtown Tel Aviv with lots of green spaces. Um, typically, our international students come from all over the world, from 100 plus countries, from South America, from North America, from Europe, Asia, Australia, um, as well as the international community here in Tel Aviv. You heard in the film that we have 400 labs, 130 research institutes, uh, three and a half thousand projects annually. This is a big, big institution, Tel Aviv University. So I won't go into all of them, but obviously we're very proud of our ranking as Israel's largest and most comprehensive institution of higher education, the number one choice among Israeli students. We are a top 100 innovation university by Reuters. Some of these rankings, for example, the entrepreneurship ranking number five, uh, the top 10 school producing VC backed founders. We are the only non US institution to make those top 10 lists. So we are up there ranked alongside leading American universities like Stanford, MIT, UC Berkeley and Harvard. And also 55% of the population on campus is women. Two years ago, the university set up its very first Equality and Diversity Commission, headed up by Professor Netta Zeev, and their remit, it's clear, is to enhance equality and diversity among everyone on campus. So as I mentioned, you know, we're a big multidisciplinary institution of academic excellence and our impact is felt large and wide. There's nine faculties and there's a vast range of research and teaching fields that create, you know, unique and fascinating connections between disciplines that are not traditionally connected to each other. And that alone provides infinite possibilities for academic creativity. And um, as I mentioned, 130 research institutes and 400 labs world-class faculty, renowned professors. Every year our students perform over 300,000 hours of community service. And of course, we're in Tel Aviv, the wonderful Mediterranean city of Tel Aviv, which leads me on to this slide. Uh, if you've never been to Tel Aviv before, it's a pulsating, vibrant city. As you can see, it's a coastal city with amazing beaches. It's Israel's cultural and commercial capital. It's been called the Mediterranean capital of cool by the New York Times. It's a non-stop city with amazing nightlife, cuisines and cultures, uh, a city you can never stop exploring. There's over 100 sushi restaurants. It's home to the world's most sushi restaurants per capita, behind only Tokyo and New York. The Silicon Valley of the Middle East, there's over 6,000 startups in this city. It's also a dog-friendly city. It's home one of the highest dog-to-human ratios in the world. Tel Aviv is home to 25,000 registered dogs um, and a human population of just over 400,000. So very, very uh, dog friendly and an amazing city to live in. The tagline of the city is nonstop and our tagline here at the International School and at Tel Aviv University is nonstop discovery. Um, if there's one thing else I want you to take away from, you know, my session today about obviously the wonderful city of Tel Aviv and the University of Tel Aviv University is Israel's largest and most comprehensive institution. The second thing, uh, the third thing is the, inter the student life team. We call them the Madrachim. And if you know Hebrew, that means guide or counselor. And they are there for you. So they're there, one, to give you a nice soft landing. So when you come to us, you're not coming to a foreign country. They are there on arrival day. They organize orientation. They are all Israeli students, all post army doing their first or second degree with us. And they live in the dorms with you. They are your people 24, they're available 24 seven for any issues or support you need. That's not academic. You've lost your bank card. You need someone to speak Hebrew. They're your go-to people. They live in the dorms with you and they'll also take you off on, they'll do events on campus you know, yoga night, movie night, pizza night, and um, day trips in Tel Aviv in Jerusalem and overnight trips in the north and the south. So you'll get to experience the best that Israel has to offer. This actual picture was one of the, the student life activities on the Jaffa tour um, taken just last year. So like I said, you know, even though we have 2000 plus international students, we get to know all of them very well. 
uh, and you very much come and join the family. And all these activities and events that we do with the Student Life Team, they are with all of the other international students, so you'll get to meet other international students from other programmes. And I think this sense of community extends through into the, the accommodation. So yeah, we have housing on campus. There's some pictures here. They're really nice. They, you can either live on your own in a studio or one bedroom apartment, or you can share an apartment with someone else. And uh, they all have kitchens, laundry, Wi-Fi, security, uh, you know, uh, study rooms, social rooms, uh, literally just adjacent to campus. And uh, what we do is we keep all of the international students together into the buildings, but at the same time, you're surrounded by Israeli students. So we like to think that you get the best of both worlds. Uh, before I be uh, finish, I just want to mention something about funding as well. Um, I'll send all this out by email afterwards to everyone, so don't worry about taking notes or writing down the link here. But in addition to the, the program scholarships, we also have our own scholarship fund that we give out. We also have scholarship funds relate, you know, that are for students from specific regions and countries. Also, we have Israel's very first um, sports scholarship that we signed a year and a half ago. So I will send out this link to everyone as well. So do, I do recommend to look through it. We also have a list there of external organizations that give some sometimes generous scholarships and grants to students. To, to come in to study um, here at Tel Aviv University. Um, and that's me. I hope that's given you sort of a broad macro level about Tel Aviv University, the Lowy International School um, and student life. I will be here for the rest of the session as well. So I'm also here to answer any questions you have about funding or student life or housing um, or anything else. Thank you very much. Okay. I think I'm going to hand over to uh, Professor Abraham to present the program. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Ronan Abraham, and I'm the head of the Parasol LLM program. With me here is Renata Brami, who is the administrative director uh, of the program. So any questions you have, you can either write it in the chat or email Renata whenever you want. Um, and let me share my screen and have a quick presentation as well before we have our distinguished guest, uh, Dr. Uri Akohan. Um, okay, so let me. While Ronan share his screen, I just want to say hi to everyone. Thank you, David and Uri for joining us today. And I would love to see you guys your faces, because I know I talked to some of you already. Ian, I'm seeing you're here, Grace, Emilia, Deborah. So I would love to see you guys. Thank you. And I hope you enjoy. If you have any questions, just talk to me. I'm here. Yes, it's on your camera, guys. Don't be shy. Yeah. Um, all right. So um, this is Tel Aviv from the West, picture from the Southwest. And let me quickly start with um, with a video clip. Um, here, it's here. And let me just make sure I shared it correctly. Um, yeah, I think I shared it. Let me stop share for a second and share again. Make sure I shared it with the share sound. Yeah, that's what I wanna make sure I do. Okay. I knew I wanted to do an international LLM, and I started to look around at, uh, at some of the programs. And immediately, the uh, strong focus on international business transactions at Tel Aviv uh, jumped out at me. When I was searching for the program, Israel was my first choice, as I really wanted to explore this country and to feel what it means to live here. There are many tracks on the program. Uh, there is technology, business, uh, human rights. This university enjoys an excellent reputation and attracts outstanding professors. Like I finished the law and technology track, so you're, you feel more ready to get into the startup nation and maybe you can work as a lawyer in a law firm. You can pursue a PhD as I did. For me, it was, it was fascinating to learn from not only from professors, but also from practitioners, partners at major law firms. Israel, and specifically Tel Aviv, is a very 
good place to learn you know, business, business law, uh, because just it's the start of capital of the world. It's full of energy, creativity, innovation, and everything. This is where Startup Nation is. This is where the startup scene is in Israel. People, atmosphere, classrooms, everything is perfect here. There were people who were getting their second masters, there were people who were already working, who had a lot of experience in their field of work. A lot of cultural dynamics and a lot of different views. So having an international LLM program allows you to learn more about the world, have connections uh, with students from all over the world. There was such a, an academic level that I've never seen before in any other academic institutions that I've studied. You get to study not only from established professors in the law faculty, but also from practitioners and activists who are immersed in social issues that sit at the heart of Israeli society. Campus life is, is exceptional. Nowhere else is having the beach so close. Being able to just go to the beach and have some drinks and uh, go into the city. It's been amazing so far, and I'm really sad when I think about leaving. Your Mediterranean uh, gateway to global excellence. Here you will learn with the best students in the world, from the best professors in the world, in one of the best cities in the world. Join us. The program offers a unique opportunity to combine the studies of doctrine, theory, and practice in a country which is one of the most interesting places to study human rights, and in a country which is full of innovation and technology. Okay. Let me just get rid of this video. Um, okay, so uh, let me go back to sharing my presentation. Okay, so uh, there's some overlap with David's presentation, so I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna, you know, repeat stuff. But uh, there. Are, 30,000 students in, in Tel Aviv, 2,000 are international students. And what is required for you to become an LLM student? You have to have a previous degree in law. Uh, your GPA has to be at least three on a point of four. You have to pass a TOEFL or an other equivalent English test. Um, there's a short essay, really kind of just tell us who you are and what your aspirations are. Uh, your CV, recommendation letters, and if you pass all that, then you get into our LLM program, which is a one-year intensive degree taught in English, three consecutive semesters, starts on first week of September and in July. The tuition is $21,000, but we do have various scholarships based on both merit and need-based. I saw someone in the chat ask me, what is the percentage of scholarship you get? Well, it depends. It depends on, you know, if you, have, if you come with a GPA of 4.0, or above, uh, you'll get a different scholarship than if you come with a 3.0. So, or if you come from, um, you know, depending also on the country, the region, it, it's very individualistic and we, um, so, you know, you're welcome to apply and we'll see what happens. Uh, we accept up to 20 students a year. Usually we have around 15, but sometimes we're about a little bit above, sometimes a little bit below. So it's very intimate. Some of the courses are taught just for the LLM class. You have like five courses taught just for the LLM class. So you're a very cohesive group. But other than that, you choose courses with other uh, LLB and exchange students. So you get to both have your uh, LLM envelope, but also you mingle with Israeli students. So you, as David said, you get the best of all worlds. Uh, what, what is unique about our LLM? You have what we call the global legal practice between the two semesters, the winter break or the spring break, between the two semesters break, uh, you get, if you don't want to go back home or just tour the Mediterranean, uh, you can experience the local firm, law firm um, in either one of the tracks. We'll talk about the tracks later. And that will give you uh, a credit for, for, the, for the degree. Also, if you want, you can stay another year and write a thesis. We've had several students doing that and later on continuing for a PhD, either here or in other countries. Classes are taught by professors from all over the world. Every year we have about 50 professors visiting from all over the world. They'll teach in English. You get to um, 
choose to be to take their courses in addition to Tel Aviv's own unique uh, professors. Uh, there are all sorts of field excursion. David mentioned the, uh, the Israeli Supreme Court, the Israeli Parliament, the Knesset. We have uh, other tours, uh, both in Tel Aviv and in northern Israel. And as I said, we have uh, substation fellowships and scholarships. Basically, we have four tracks. We have the general tracks where you don't commit to anything in particular, but then we have a technology law, business law, and international law and human rights. Overall, as I said, you can choose from over 50 courses. And here you see just a random selection of courses from recent years in each one of the tracks. And uh, we talked about the trips. David talked about, um, you know, the, all the social involvement, tons of social involvement here. If you're a social animal, you'll get a lot of uh, what you like. If you're not, you can just, you know, choose what to engage in. Uh, no one forces you to do anything, but there are a lot of opportunities here to engage both uh, with Israeli and other international students. Uh, if you choose to live in the dorms, uh, it's, you know, just... Um, three minutes walk from campus. Uh, you have security, health included, uh, all sorts of uh, good stuff to live there. So if you're interested, contact us, email study law. This is Renata's email. She'll get back to you as soon as possible. So uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, give the microphone to Dr. Uria Cohen, who is an assistant professor at Tel Aviv University Faculty of Law and a faculty fellow and the chief at the Chief Justice Mayor Shamgar Center for Digital Law and Innovation. Dr. Cohen research and teaching span intellectual property across the digital technology, health privacy law, and the law and economics. His recent publications include Copyright Regenerated, Harnessing Gen Generative AI to Measure Originality and Copyright Scope, which has been published or is forthcoming at Harvard Journal of Law Technology, and the policy implication of user-generated data network effects, which has been published at uh, the Forum Intellectual Property Media and Entertainment uh, Review. And his talk today is about bias as a feature, harnessing AI to reform legal standards. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat, but also at the end of his uh, lecture, there will be time for Q&A. Dr. Cohen, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. So thank you, Professor Avraham. Just one second, let me see if I can share my screen, uh, my presentation. Okay, does it work? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, so first of all, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone in the Persol program for having me. Um, it's wonderful to be here and to talk with you a little bit about my research and about our work at Tel Aviv. We have a, a very strong emphasis in our faculty on issues dealing with technology. Um, as my colleagues have said, Tel Aviv is a major place for uh, doing this kind of work. And uh, it's a very exciting time to, to do, to, to do technology-related work, especially in the field of AI. And we, as we all know, AI is now available everywhere. Um, we all use ChatGPT and related chatbots to help us write seminars. Uh, don't tell everybody I did. I said that, or do other things. Um, but not only users, not only end users use AI. We know that uh, many public institutions use AI. We we see uh, um, lawyers starting to harness AI to help them writing court briefs, uh, judges, um, um, prison prison authorities. Uh, even legislators use AI. So AI is, is everywhere. And every time we hear about AI, we usually hear about bias, right? AI, AI generated bias, data driven bias. We hear about it everywhere. AI may reinforce biases in society, uh, replicate biases in society. We see Netflix movies, uh, uh, best selling books talking about that. So bias is everywhere. And and in a series of projects, uh, myself and, and a group of other scholars from Tel Aviv University, like Professor Niva Elkin Cohen from our law faculty and, and other researchers on the technical side of the campus from uh, 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 the computer science department, the electric engineering department, we'll see the credits in the end of this uh, presentation. 
We're working on a series of projects, cutting edge projects, they're trying to see if bias in AI systems can actually be looked at as a feature rather than as a bug. Okay, but before, before I talk about that, let me just make a quick overview of why we think AI systems uh, incorporate, replicate, uh, amplify biases in society and why the uh, conventional wisdom is that bias is actually a bug and not a feature. So as we know, AI systems are not created out of thin air. People create them and they're based on data that uh, uh, replicates human behavior, preferences, uh, and so forth. And because humans are not perfect, humans have their own biases, historical biases, then we think that AI systems are prone to replicate and uh, are mirror these biases. So the literature that deals with AI uh, usually divides considers different levers of how uh, uh, biases can be reflected in AI systems, and I'll make a quick overview. So the most intuitive uh, uh, option is maybe bias is incorporated in the people who create these AI systems, right? P programmers create AI, uh, computer programmers, and if, I, re if I, I, I wrote a programmer in Google to see what I get, and it, it, it wasn't as, as, as good as I hoped uh, for the pur purposes of this presentation, but you can still see that we see more white programmers than uh, programmers representing minority groups. Um, uh, and we know that, that people that uh, finish uh, uh, their, their university education period with a PhD in computer science and, and go to all these uh, companies, OpenAI, Microsoft, Google, uh, it's a question of to what extent they represent our society, to what extent they 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 actually diverse enough and incorporate the views of society. And this is one one possible pro problems. We know that many corporations trying to deal with this uh, with the diversifying their portfolio of workers. Another problem, I, I think the most uh, comprehensive problem is bias in the data. AI systems use a lot of data. Uh, uh, part of it is behavioral data or that data that incorporates historical biases. And there is a, a very common saying in uh, uh, data analytics, garbage, on, uh, garbage in, garbage out, essentially saying that if we feed an AI system with uh, bad data, data that incorporates bias, we're likely to have uh, biases in the output of the system as well. That's pretty straightforward. So here are some uh, uh, common examples that we see. Uh, the Thai bot is a bot used by Microsoft in around 2016. Microsoft tried to play with the idea of having a bot on Twitter to converse with people in natural language. And pretty soon, uh, some malicious actors trying tried to converse with the bot using uh, not so appropriate language. And pretty soon, the, the AI agent inhaled uh, um, uh, the data, the bad data, and became a racist algorithm himself saying bad things and Microsoft had to take it down. Um, the idea here is that the bot learned from language. He learned bad language and he uh, replicated this tendency and created bad language himself. Another common example is this campaign from the UN Women uh, campaign using the feature of Google, the autocomplete uh, uh, function of Google to show us that when we use autocomplete, the feature that Google's use uh, crowdsourcing, what people usually look at when they look online. And as you can see in this example, when we say, when you type Google needs to, the Google search and then fills it with things that we don't think are appropriate, like women should need to know their place, be controlled or be disciplined. I, I believe that Google fixed that since then. But this mirrors the idea that in some cases, we cannot always find these specific places and correct them. People are, are uh, when, we, when we look at big numbers, at crowdsourcing information, we sometimes see biased results, we see biased tendencies. This is a more uh, uh, a recent example from Stable Diffusion. Stable Diffusion is a model that generates art. So we typed in uh, information, uh, textual information in natural language and prompt, and the generator creates art, like uh, ChatGPT or uh, ChatGPT is for text, but uh, uh, the same idea. Um, and here, there's an example when you say, 
uh, draw me a person at social services versus draw me a person, a productive person to the right, we can see that these are all, of course, there's not real people. This, this is just uh, um, synthetic examples, but we can see that a productive person, the machine sees a productive person is uh, predominantly white, sitting in an office doing some uh, 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 white collar job versus a person in the social services, mostly minority people. So we can see the biases being replicated in the data and incorporated no matter if we generate text. There are other researchers saying that ChatGPT, when I ask ChatGPT to write me a recommendation letter for someone, if I use a female name, it uses different language as opposed to if I use a, a more masculine name. And again, our language, our, the words we use all incorporate social biases and that's a problem. Um, another problem is that AI is not only replicating the biases in the data, but it actually amplifies them. And one of the arguments here, I gave this, uh, uh, um, this example from the uh, predictive police system. The idea here is that sometimes in predictive policing, the AI is supposed to tell the police station which areas are more likely to have crimes in them so they can send uh, a police officers there. And because these systems, again, uh, are working on past data, so if there is specific neighborhoods that are problematic, the system will send police officers to there because it's more likely that the crime will be in these neighborhoods. There will be more police officers there looking around and they will find some someone to uh, that can generate some sort of malicious uh, things. And the data of catching uh, uh, fighting crime in these areas will go back to the algorithm say, well, we found some some crime there and the, we'll, we'll have this reinforcing effect, this feedback loop where the system continues to send people to the same areas finding crime and then uh, the trend can, can replicate itself. It's, it's not always the case, clearly. I mean, if there are more people there, uh, more police people, maybe it will improve the area and things will change. But the idea of reinforce, reinforcement uh, of biases because of this feedback loop, something that computer scientists sometimes called um, model collapse situation when the model learns on its own data, it's a, prob it's a problem uh, that is familiar in the literature. We also see this in other areas, for example, in social scientists, we, some, we, some, we sometimes say that there is a problem of filter bubble or echo chambers uh, in our information environment online. So if I watch uh, action movies on Netflix and Netflix keeps sending me action movies, uh, I may end up reinforcing my own biases to watch action movies because that's all I see and that's what I like and I continue to watch that. And I don't watch other things and maybe if I didn't have this personalization filtration, I would see, I don't know, documentaries and so forth. Okay, so this is this is the problem of of uh, uh, biased biased data that is reflected by the model and again reinforced by the model. Another problem is maybe we have biases in the model itself. So one example is if we optimize for something that we think is a proxy for what we want uh, uh, what what we want the AI system to do, but it's a bad proxy. So for example, the very common example here is from this uh, article was published on Science. And the idea here is that uh, the system in this case wants to optimize for how to distribute the limited resources a hospital have for patients. And they want to bring, to invest most resources of the institution to the patients that needs most help, so that, that have the most uh, 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 serious injury or, or health related issue. The problem was that the optimizing factor for knowing which patient needs more resources was how much people are willing to pay to get financial, uh, to get uh, health related aid. And the idea was the more, uh, the more sick I am, the more injured I am, uh, my, the more serious is my uh, uh, health related issue, I will, I will need to pay more money. But obviously this didn't happen as uh, the researchers planned because we know that money talks not not reflects exactly the seriousness of the problem, but also how much money I have to invest uh, uh, in, 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 in treatment. And the, the algorithm was biased uh, to privileged uh, uh, individuals and biased against minority groups. Okay, but this is something that at least in theory, not always in practice, but at least in theory, we can correct, right? We can find a better proxy for how to measure 
health problems that is not related to uh, financial investments or resources. And then maybe we can solve this problem, but not always. Sometimes we have issue with the model that we want to optimize for something that we simply do not have a metrics, something that we can optimize for that is well accepted to deal with this problem. The most common example for this is the compass system, a system that was designed uh, uh, to help prison officials in a, in a uh, uh, parole situation, parole pen pending inmates that needs to that the prison authorities need to decide whether to release them or not. What is the likelihood that they? What is the risk level that the system predicts uh, that they will commit crime again? The more risky I am, the less likely the prison authorities are to let me go. And now we have uh, these parole committees that do it by uh, uh, use uh, human wisdom to come to this decision. But gradually we use AI systems to help us review the records of inmates and give inmates risk scores. Risk scores to help um, the authorities decide which, uh, in which case they should uh, uh, release inmates and in which case not. And the most familiar example and the most common system used in, in, uh, uh, in the US is the compass system. And the compass system is considered to be fair. The company that created it showed that it was fair because it was well calibrated. So you can see in this graph, it, it, if we take uh, uh, different groups, for example, here, African-Americans in, in blue versus Caucasian in uh, uh, orange, we can see for that for each uh, each risk score, that's the X axis. If my risk score is two or my risk score is 10, we can see the Y axis that more or less both whites and uh, African-Americans have the, the about the same percentage within each risk score. So the system is well calibrated. Each different group is, is more or less equally represented in the distribution. However, pretty soon, there was this uh, investigative journalistic group, ProPublica made this uh, um, article that got many headlines saying that the system is actually tremendously biased. Why? Because while the system was fair from a group fairness perspective, meaning that each group was well uh, represented in the model, the, the system was not fair from an individual perspective. Specifically, from a false positive and false negative perspective, if you can see in the small table here to the right, uh, let's take the the, uh, the first row. The system labeled higher risk people who actually did not re reoffend. Here, the distribution was forty four point nine percent African American and only uh, twenty three point five percent white. So the system was biased against African Americans, saying that more African-Americans were labeled high, high risk, but was actually, they were actually false positive. So the system marked them as high risk, where in fact they were low risk. Uh, so in any, in any event, the idea is, and computer scientists actually developed this idea and developed more than 23 different uh, definitions, mathematical definitions of fairness, saying that we can optimize for different metrics of fairness, but we as as policymakers need to, to tell the algorithmic ma makers, what do we, do we mean when we say something needs to be fair? Fairness is actually saying in math, saying many different things that are not compatible with one another. And we need to choose when we say to the model, be fair, what do we mean by being fair? The last point I wanna make is biased in, de in deployment. And I will do it pretty quickly because time is running out. Um, bias in deployment essentially uh, points to something that in learning theory is called the trade-off between exploration and exploitation. So if we think about it, an AI systems can only know if a specific drug is, uh, is valuable for a patient or not based on the people who actually get the drug. And we, all, we can only tell if someone who was released from jail was actually involved in crime again if it was released. If we didn't release a person, we don't know what will happen. So an AI system, by definition, needs to sometimes let people go or give some drugs to people who shouldn't get the drugs to explore and see what happens. And in some cases, this is not something that we want to have, right? 
uh, especially in areas like letting people go from jail or, or prescribing drugs. We don't want to explore, let the system explore at the expense of individuals for the benefits of the group. But we can use a much more simple example. We can use ways. When we use ways or Google Maps, who bought ways, uh, to know what, what, how to get to our home, um, uh, we, we all do what ways tells us because we believe that's the right, that's the quickest way to go. But sometimes there are new roads coming up and ways needs to send up some people to explore new avenues, new, new alternatives to see maybe there is a shorter way to the destination. Now, who should pay the price of actually do the investigation on his own expense, but to the benefit of the group? So this, the way the system is calibrated and the way that it distributes the extra effort of exploration may also create biases. Okay. So this is enough for why biases is usually perceived as a bug, and it is perceived as a bug often and, and for a good reason. But uh, my point is this in, in this project is that uh, why do we always think that the system incorporates biases is, is a bad thing? I mean, when we think that the, that the, the AI system that is based on large databases are in fact... Um, are in fact a, a, a bad, we believe that there is something within society that is baked into our culture and our speech that uh, incorporates some, some bad things, the historical uh, disparities and so forth. And many, many times this is true. But usually, I think, we believe that the majority of people has something good to say. Right? This is why we believe in democracy. We believe that the majority of information, the majority of the data, most people need to have something positive to say. And therefore, if we look, this is the idea of crowdsourcing, right? We want to, if we ask a question, there is all these show games. When you ask how many coins are in this uh, 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 basket, and then you ask all the people in the audience, and once we incorporate a lot of opinions, there is a likelihood that we'll get to the right result. And the same idea is what guided us in this project. We believe that bias in society in large enough numbers can provide us with good insights that as individuals or as researchers, it's something that be before AI we could not discover. And this is something that can possibly help us in many, in many things, but for our purposes can help us in law. Okay, so uh, uh, pretty quickly, I'll give you an example about how Generative AI, generative AI are AI systems like ChatGPT or DALI E or Staple Diffusion generative uh, uh, machines that we provide them with a textual prompt and they create something for us. They can create text, they can create images. How do they work? And these sy systems work by generalizing. Okay, so if we give a system, let's say, uh, input of red cars, blue cars, and red buses, the systems could create blue buses. Although it didn't see blue buses in its training set, it could generalize the idea, the idea of buses, the idea of having different colors and create something totally new based on the insights it gets. Like a little kid actually learns stuff and then can do new things himself. But nevertheless, while the model generalizes, it is still biased towards the information that it, that it got in its training set. So for example, if I'll feed an algorithm with different images, but each image has only two um, um, uh, uh, two different uh, features in it. Here, I don't know, boxes and and and, and balls. But in every image, there is just two Im two uh, uh, instances inside. The model can generalize. It means that the model can create two, three, and more uh, uh, images. Create one, two, three but the model will still be biased to what it saw more often. The model will be biased towards creating two images. Okay, so we can see it here. The model is more likely to create two images than other things. Um, we can take the same example using an in-painting technique. In-painting is when we delete something from an image and let the model create itself. So this is the famous painting by René Magritte, Son of Man, and, uh, um, and we delete it the, the apple from the painting and so what the model will will recreate. Now intuitively we think, well, the model should create the apple, but no. Every time we tried it, the model actually reconstructed the human face and that's 
that makes sense because the model is biased toward people. When a model see a people in a suit, it assumes that the person have a face rather than an app. The model is biased toward the human face. Uh, here we tried with the earring. The model is biased toward many different kinds of earrings. It's not reproducing the same earring. Okay, now how do we take this idea to inform judicial standards? So the most intuitive example, and that's an example that we are investigating in our contemporary work, is to inform copyright law. Uh, in copyright law, the, the most important thing is the originality of the creation. Now, judges for, for centuries try to think what is originality. We, do, we know that we don't uh, evaluate originality in copyright law, but originality actually Im impacts everything. Originality impacts the strength of the legal right, the scope of the legal right, and that can Im impact licensing, it, it impacts the privileges we have, uh, uh, like fair uses, uh, it impacts litigation, whether I copied your work or was just influenced by your work. In all these cases, the judges will sometimes uh, directly and sometimes indirectly, subconsciously will, will think about the originality of the contribution of the author. Okay, but judges cannot evaluate originality. This is a famous quote by Judge uh, Holmes that says that it will be uh, a terrible thing to allow us jurists, we are boring and dull people, to actually praise the originality of art. Okay, so uh, uh, our point is that with the aid of AI, we can actually harness AI to appraise originality. We can use big data to do different procedure. I won't go into this, something that is called textual inversion to do the opposite of what generative AI usually does. Generative AI takes a lot of text and produce an output, and we essentially want to do the opposite thing. Takes an output and see how much the text that I provided is actually original compared to everything that the model saw. Assuming that the model saw all human expression, we can say, oh, the red parts here, the red part of your text is actually completely non-original. Maybe it's so non-original, it's so generic that it shouldn't be protected at all. Maybe this photo of a cat is so generic that it shouldn't be protected at all. But more, more interestingly, we can actually quantify originality. We can say that your text as a whole is four, is five. And by being able to actually measure originality in a way that is predictable, accurate, and, and uh, documented from text to case, to text will actually help judges to use vague standards like originality in a way that is much more accurate and predictable. Um, we can do it with images, we can do it with music. I'm getting into uh, quite uh, uh, late in, in, in this talk, so I will quickly, briefly just suggest other ways to generalize from this idea. Uh, we have in law many other standards that are vague, that use uh, uh, um, judgments of judges, in a way that is not predictable. We have the reasonable person standards. In patent law, we have the person of ordinary skill in the art. Now, I don't wanna jump too quickly, but every standard requires its own analysis. For example, the reasonable person standard is a normative standard. It's not an empirical standard. So it's not enough to say what society says is reasonable. We need to incorporate some value into how society do things. We can, so we can say that the reasonable person uh, is meant to advance um, social wealth, it's supposed to advance distributive justice, whatever. But we need to have some normative anchoring. It's not that you can just mirror society and says what's reasonable, but at least we have a benchmark. To which we can say, if we have the right approach, we can say what's reasonable in society, and then we can make some normative tweaks to it. Other standards, like the person of ordinary skill in the art, is not normative standard. It's a descriptive standard. We need to know what an ordinary person in the art actually knows. There are other descriptive standards. In uh, uh, um, international law, we have customary laws. We need to know what countries usually do. Okay, in all these standards, we can use AI to actually help us understand human behavior better. This is a, a cutting edge research that is not quite what I'm suggesting, but it provides some uh, glimpse to it. It's called generative agents. And the idea is, is to incorporate long, large language models to actually create uh, generative agents, people, that, like in the sim games, interact with one another and, and form their own relationships, their own behavior, and then we can actually look at them as like, like mice in the lab and see how society, based on our language, would have uh, um, acted. Um, 
two quick examples. We can use Gen AI not only to understand biases, something that we already know, right? We know that language is biased, but we can actually measure it very accurately. We can say, uh, we can do these metrics where Jane worked as versus Jim worked as and see how the universe of professions is distributed uh, exactly and how the bias in language is actually come into being. And we can actually fix that if we want to fix it. Um, for example, use some uh, corrective measures, we can actually know mathematically how to fix it in a way that is very accurate, as opposed to judges who can just say, we want this policy or other policymakers this way or the other. We can also use AI to find biases in areas that we didn't know exist. So now in law, we have protected groups. We have gender, we have uh, um, um, we have uh, uh, minorities groups that we want, we want to protect, but but actually AI can help us to find new groups. So this is an example of an AI system discovering that if we tell the uh, chat GPT, choose a random number between one to 10, uh, one to 100, the, the model is biased toward the number 42. Now, many of us will understand why, of course, 42 is the uh, solution for the universe. But again, in a situation where we assume that the distribution should be completely random, we can use AI to discover biases. Okay, another example is that we, if we ask a model to create a, a, a figure of a, a watch showing one o'clock, that we will see that every time the model uh, generates a clock showing 10 and 10 minutes. So the model is biased to the time of 10 and 10 minutes. Why? Because most photos of, of watches uh, uh, are taken this way because it's more aesthetically pleasing. But the idea is that we can use AI to actually explore biases in areas that we don't think uh, we didn't know exist. The final point, and uh, I will finish with this, is that we can use uh, the bias of large language models or other la large AI's foundation system models to inform end users. Okay, so for this presentation, so one example is of course copyright. If I If I am able to know something that I draw, how original it is, it is useful to me as an end user. Maybe I want to license it. Maybe I want to sell it to ChatGPT, uh, to OpenAI. It's important to have a metrics both for an end user, not only from policymaker perspective. But in other areas, consider um, misinformation, fake news. So I, I, I generated quickly before this uh, talk, this uh, example. I used my colleague, uh, Professor Niva Elkin Cohen. I didn't want to use my name. Plus, I don't think the ChatGPT is, is that familiar with me already. So I said, summarize the achievements of Professor Niva Elkin Cohen here to the left. And I said, summarize the achievements of Winston Churchill here to the right. And as you can see, ChatGPT uh, created uh, uh, aesthetically pleasing answers, both of them correct, both of them looks the same. Me as an end user have no idea to be to figure out whether this information is actually correct and how to distinguish the answer for Winston Churchill and for Neva Elkin Cohen. Nevertheless, it's pretty obvious that the answer of Winston Churchill is much more likely to be correct than the answer for Neva Elkin Cohen. Because although my uh, colleague, Professor Neva Elkin Cohen, is a highly distinguished scholar, I think Winston Churchill is a bit more famous than her. And there is, in the data set, there is many more information about Winston Churchill some of it conflicting information, some of it criticizing his work, some of it um, praising its work. So it's much more likely that the output of the system for Winston Churchill will be much more balanced, much more accurate, as opposed to Neva Elkin Cohen. But I am unable to see it just from looking at the output. If we harness the, um, the bias in the model to have some disclosure for the end user, it will be able to tell me, yeah, Winston Churchill, I am biased toward Winston Churchill. I have much more information there. It's more likely that the information for Winston Churchill will be more accurate. If somebody will write a blog about Neva Elkin Cohen that, that will uh, say something bad about her that is wrong, it's much more likely to be in the output than in the case of Winston Churchill. And one final slide is we can use this idea for personalization. Everywhere online, we see personalization, right? We see the same videos that we want. We, we buy the same stuff. We have a recommendation on Amazon, on TikTok, on Facebook, on YouTube. We see the same videos again and again. If we harness the bias of the model, it can give us some sort of indication what the majority of the world thinks about a particular issue. 
Now, sometimes this is not a good thing, right? We know, especially for news, that inaccurate news can, uh, can be viral, can spread very quickly. But there are instances where something is, is, um, is very rare, something that only radical people see is more likely to be associated with like misinformation and so forth. So if we harness the big data of generative models and inform people who starting to be in their own echo chamber, see the same thing that they like, the same thing that they press on, have some small disclosure that's saying, listen, you go in too much into the rabbit hole. You're being away from the bias of society in these specific areas. The information diet that you're consuming is radical. Maybe it's something that will be valuable to us. YouTube is doing it, as you can see in this um, 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 print screen here, by using Wikipedia as a disclosure, saying this video about reptiles uh, uh, overloads walking around us, uh, Wikipedia saying that this is possibly conspiracy theory. But Wikipedia is essentially... Uh, the bias of society. We believe it's a crowdsourcing uh, platform, but we can use the idea of a bias of the model and use it in many more instances, not just uh, like here in Wikipedia. Okay, thank you so much. And I'm I'm ready for questions if you have any. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uri, can you please uh, unshare your screen? Yes, of course. Okay, uh, any questions from the crowd? Don't be shy, you can, yeah, see there's a question. No, that's something else. Uh, if you want to ask a question, raise your hand. Otherwise, I will ask a question, and which is fine by me, definitely fine by me. Okay, so, Uwe, can I um, generate text that will be AI proof in the sense that, for example, can I ask ChatGPT to generate text that later query of chat gpt will not identify it as non-original so i think, Do you I think question? yeah i think there is two different questions baked into one here okay. so one question is whether i can generate something that chat gpt will not recognize as its own output right is that what right. you're referring to yeah. um so uh so in, in the originality work, we're we're looking at all the outputs as one. So we're saying you bring the system something, it doesn't matter if it was created by the algorithm, by my kid or by myself, and the model will evaluate it based on the corpus of the data that it already knows, and it will give you a number. Um, so for our purposes, we don't care. In fact, for from a perspective, from a policy perspective, we think that in the future people will generate works by augmenting their all own creativity using AI systems. So all work will be some kind of hybrid using uh, these systems, so we don't care. Um, but from different perspectives, we do care, right? We want to know whether the um, whether the text was generated by a machine or by a human. And this is a very serious question, um, and many people work on that. This is not something I do in my own research, but there are systems that try to recognize that, uh, try to identify patterns based on the system's biases and according to that says no this is not something uh that you created a human created this is something that an algorithm created these systems are not perfect and there is like uh they're, they're always trying to improve and the uh, the model creators uh, are trying to play with this and and it's like a whack and mole game it's 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 very hard to uh to, to know but there is systems and there is not only in in things that ai generated but they are also trying. Uh, there, there are serious efforts um, to create protocols for documenting how digital files are shared online. Not only how they are created, but how they are manipulated. So it's possibly that you wrote something, somebody else took it and edited. It, and we're trying to find system to document everything that's going on online to help people recognize misinformation and be able to authenticate stuff. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, well, that concludes our session today. I want to thank uh, David from uh, Low International School, Renata, and our, of course, Dr. Uriah Cohen for a fascinating talk. If you have uh, further questions about uh, the LLM program, please, again, uh, email Renata. Renata, um, maybe you can stay for another two minutes in case someone wants to ask you something. But other than that, thank you all. And I hope to see you all here next September. 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Thank everyone. So much. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Rakoin. That was a very interesting lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone has questions? <laughs>